which was the breakthrough. He's an investigator at MD Anderson. I believe he's going to win the Nobel Prize for his work. But at that time, that was a mother who wanted to see her child graduate from high school. She had tried everything, had failed everything, and is well on her way to a fate that was the case for virtually all patients with advanced melanoma at the time. She's alive 13 years later because of Jim Allison's conceptual breakthrough, the new drug in that area, and the ability of now for us to use the word cure in the same sentence with advanced melanoma. That is happening, and it's happening at a very, very fast pace now. This is just one example of many where we need to be in a position to offer what will be the future medicines and the standard of care for patients who have life-threatening diseases. So the only hope is really uh, access to a drug that requires special consideration by the therapeutic sponsor. So you have single use of new or novel treatments that really need to be thought about. So reforms should be considered now. Uh, I've emphasized that we're in a different uh, time at this point where we have the science of cancer rapidly progressing towards precision medicine where genomic knowledge is already influencing in a very dramatic way treatment decisions and the end goal should be to increase access to novel potentially life-saving therapies that match genomic profiles while respecting ethical professional legal and intellectual guidelines and practices so reforms and solutions, we have to have a constructive dialogue with the many stakeholders involved in these decisions. They're listed here. The industry, the providers, the patients, the families, the survivors, the policy makers really need to identify all the related issues, regulatory, legal barriers, and develop reasonable solutions. The current situation is not good enough. We really need to come together with solutions. And we want to develop a pathway, a framework for expedited review and approval of drugs and therapeutics for patients with extremely rare circumstances. So these solutions have to ensure a couple of things. First and foremost, we have to preserve the integrity of clinical trials. We cannot have uh, trials that are underway that are going to have a huge impact potentially for many thousands of lives to come and have any issues impact on that. So biopharmaceutical companies can move forward in clinical trials to test these novel agents and to enter into single-use agreements in a way that these clinical testing results are not hampered by a compassionate use arrangement. And frankly, it's important to appreciate, again, that children are different from adults. And even if you saw a toxicity-associated effect on the side of children, it doesn't mean that that would also occur in adults and vice versa, importantly. So we need a common sense approach here so that kids can have access to potentially life-saving drugs and that we can move along during that process to identify the optimal use of those agents uh, for a larger fraction of children. So I'll end here and I'll take uh, any questions. Uh, again, it's important to appreciate that as a nation, uh, we've now put ourselves in a position to really go from a disease care state to a health care state we know a lot about the instigators of cancer. We know a lot about how to detect cancer earlier. We know a great deal about the molecular underpinnings of cancer so that we can apply the right drugs to the right patient in the right time. This is game changing. It's occurred in a very narrow window. The uh, old organizational constructs and regulatory frameworks need dramatic uh, modification for us to be able to match the opportunity uh, with the magnitude of the need. Uh, cancer extracts a very significant social and economic toll on families and on the nation. Uh, we're in a position to make an impact and it's critically important, as Dr. Collins mentioned, that we've got to maintain the wind in the sails of innovation, of knowledge, and application of that knowledge. Uh, it's not whether we can afford to support the NIH. We can, can't afford not to. Uh, the, if you look simply at the magnitude of the need, simply at the changing demographics of the United States, and things like Alzheimer's alone, uh, that one disease, which today extracts about $250 billion, 
from our nation, not the least of which is uh, impact on productivity, what it does to families and so on over a prolonged period of time. But the changing demographics where we have the aging of, of the world population, 1.2 billion people over the age of 60 by 2025, we do not have the capacity to handle that need. By 2050, for Alzheimer's alone, we're going to be spending a trillion dollars in today's dollars. So the only answer is science. And we have to have the responsibility and the drive and the will to make sure that whatever we do discover is translated rapidly into clinical endpoints that actually matter for patients and families. And that's our responsibility. We're doing everything we can at MD Anderson to drive this effort. We're proud of the impact that we're having, but we need help and we need the help of the public to be able to drive what is an obvious solution, which is to support the science infrastructure that is one of the great success stories of this nation. And at this point, we are without peer, but we are losing that to other countries and we're going to lose our competitive edge and in the process really have lives uh, lost that do not need to be lost. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Dr. Pena, thank you very much for being here and for taking the time. I'm Jeffrey Skolnick. I'm from GSK, uh, also a pediatric oncologist. And uh, Pharma, the trade organization of the pharmaceutical uh, companies, we actually have a new work stream looking very specifically at compassionate use. Um, I sit on that for GSK, but I also sit on it to bring experience from the pediatric oncology side. And I'm just wondering, with respect to that first step that we can take. What do you see as really the first opportunity we have to bring all the parties together at the table to begin this better understanding of how to optimize compassionate use? Yeah, I mean clearly the compassionate use has really been amplified still further by all of the public knowledge that now exists with the transformative drugs that has just entered into the pipeline like PD-1. Uh, this morning I was on a call for half an hour uh, on a patient who, for which the indication doesn't exist for PD-1, trying to convince uh, the stakeholders to get this going. So this is, I live this every day. And at MD Anderson, uh, we are able to work with, with you and others to be able to identify uh, those individuals that should go on. And obviously we have an enormous amount of credibility and you understand the issues, etc. And we work together on those individuals. But for individuals that are out there that don't have uh, an individual such as us to advocate for them, it is, it, it's, it's challenging and it just doesn't happen. Uh, it happens, it's very inefficient. And what I think we need to do is to get together and think through with patients and family in the room and figure out how is it that we can work together so that this becomes a lot more facilitated. I understand the issues with respect to pharma and their position. They want to make sure that their clinical trials are going to be sacrosanct and if individuals go on this these, uh, compassionate use uh, that there needs to be some safe harbor so that there is whatever toxicities, et cetera, that might be unanticipated because perhaps that patient has poor performance, et cetera, that that is a safe harbor that still allows that patient to potentially gain access without there being the challenges of potentially impacting on a much broader uh, trial that may save many thousands of individuals and so on. So that, that needs to be navigated very, very carefully. And Congress and the FDA are in a really great position to be able to bring the right kinds of uh, laws and structure together to be able to provide safe harbor for pharma and at the same time lower the threshold and the difficulties that, are, that patients and families have to go through each and every day. And so this is unfolding, you know, many, many thousands of times every single day. And it's a very inefficient process. It takes a lot of time and it's heart-wrenching to see it happen the way it is. So uh, clearly the existing situation is, is not, uh, not acceptable.
Thank you for that great talk. Um, how do you think that the federally funded cancer center should approach prioritizing child cancer? What are they doing today? What should they be doing in the future? Because as we, I think the symphony analogy that Dr. Collins made was very important, which is how can we together work on these problems? Yep, uh, I will speak uh, really, uh, I've, I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, thank you for asking the question. And, and again, one of the reasons why MD Anderson is so outwardly facing uh, and it's involved in so many institutions around the country and the world and we're part of the Comprehensive Cancer Center network as well, um, is that we recognize that even as large as we are, uh, it, these problems, especially rare cancers, uh, really need scale and so on. And so uh, I do think that in the context of pediatric malignancies that we have to join for forces uh, with uh, all the nations of the world that have the ability to do analyses and clinical trials. So where we've had discussions with Germany Cancer Center, for example, so they, you know, they have uh, 2,000 patients a year and five to 600 that are running into trouble and MD Anderson has very significant reach and so on and so forth and thinking about aggregating collectively and having a worldwide network, in my view, is one step in that direction. Underneath that, there really needs to be the ability to do this uh, m uh, genome scale profiling and uh, what, the, what we're talking about in the Germany Cancer Center is not just whole genome sequencing. Uh, for the aficionados, it's, it's uh, RNA-seq, it's also methylome. There's a lot of analyses and in fact those additional dimensions uh, were shown to be critical in identifying those op opportunities for those kids. So I think that if we can find some way to support that because, you know, that is expensive and uh, the private sector is not going to be in a position. So those are the sorts of things that foundations, governments, philanthropy and so on, which is what we're doing, to basically lift that up. And then the key thing is that that has to be integrated seamlessly into a clinical trials network. And we have cooperative groups and so on, as you know, in the United States, and that's critical. That is the way that we've been able to drive things forward. But imagine doing that and scaling that across uh, ma major uh, developed countries of the world. You just think of China alone and the, uh, the numbers there. Uh, it's extraordinary. There's extraordinary opportunities. So uh, we fully intend to engage our uh, cancer center sister institutions in China, Germany, Brazil, and a variety of other places to see what we can do to really advance this. But in my view, it's organizational, it's funding, and then you've got to make sure that whatever you do do leads into the clinical trials network and that's where policy is going to be very important because if we do all this stuff and then we're in, you know, we're stuck and we can't, oh, there's a great drug out there and we can't immediately bring it into a clinical trial system, uh, then it just would have been an academic exercise and frankly that's not good enough and the public is expecting us to do much, much more and they should. One more question there. Thanks. Um, my name is Dave Dickens and I'm a full-time pediatric oncologist at the Helen DeVos Jones Hospital. As some people in this audience may know we're uh, currently running molecular guided therapy trials for neuroblastoma and medulloblastoma patients. Um, and some of the discussions we have there are similar to some of the themes I am listening to here, which is we have difficulty sometimes defining the boundary between research and practice and practice in areas where there are no proven therapies. And uh, in both of these talks, we refer to these novel therapies as experimental, which, which compounds the problem because uh, experimental therapy and defining medical necessity are vague terms that are contractually uh, debated about on a case-to-case -case basis. So maybe one of the ways we can move forward to help um, in the new era of molecular guide therapy when I can prescribe, I should also disclose I'm representing the AAP which supports prescribing off-label medications. We're going to be in an era where we have information that may be used to guide clinical care for a particular patient but not able to uh, access it, not because it's in shortage, but because it's not getting reimbursed. Thank you, for, first of all, for your service and um, 
and for all of your group's efforts to uh, help children. This is uh, very important. Um, I think you bring up an extremely important point, and I agree 110% with what you just said. It's very important to appreciate, and MD Anderson, its, its core essence is, it's not a cancer hospital. It's not a research institution. It is research-driven patient care. So for two-thirds of patients, standard of care cures them. For a third of patients, standard of care is ineffective. Research is the standard of care for those individuals. It's as much a standard of care as the standard of care is for the routine ways that we treat people. So it's important to appreciate that it is part of standard of care and that clinical trials are as important as any uh, existing standard of care. Uh, and this is critically important to understand and we've got to be able to support both. We have to improve the quality of standard of care and make it as effective as possible and we have to be able to support the standard of care that is in that research domain space uh, where it will impact and will save lives. We know that. Uh, it may not do it for all and we'll have to illuminate the right path to apply any particular agent but you, the points that you raise and the words that we select are extremely important. But this is all about what patients expect and should expect from us as healthcare providers.